Hello. Welcome to any combo lords joining me. The reason I'm lifting my computer camera around in a strange way is not to show the last three letters of the show name that sometimes sneaks in. It is to show cats. Dandelion. Dandy. Come here. They were helping out in the classroom. He's going to come back around and help out. In fact, there were enough cat appearances pre-stream of not only Dandelion, but both his brother and his adopted maybe brother, that I put a little chair for the cats with a little cushion in case I can convince the cats to chill on this cushion right next to our stream where we could have a better view of me and the cat teaching. So, somebody says there's an ad playing. That's bad. What do you mean ad playing? Um, I'm not sure exactly what you mean by ad playing. I hope you don't mean there's something playing in the background of the stream that happened once where I restream myself pulling up the stream, but I don't think I have it open like that right now. Unless I did for a minute. Um, was there an ad playing during that time? Well, I hope not. If there was, that company got a freebie and better not copyright strike me. Um, oh, if you just mean an ad played before the stream, that is intentional. I, it only makes me a few dollars per stream, but I don't make very much money. I need that few dollars per stream to put an ad at the beginning. However, they also give me the option of putting ads in the middle of the stream. I'm not going to do that to you folks. I know ads are annoying. It Before you log in, you know, log into the stream 30 seconds early if you want to make sure you're on time, because there could be an ad before, but I'm not going to play the ads that are mid stream. Those will throw us off our balance. I love when we get some live viewers, even though we don't have that many on YouTube. And I might even experiment with doing some of my more casual streams on another platform and just cutting down the best bits for YouTube. But today I did want to do another stream as the nighttime falls, which it's going to happen quite soon, but we are prepared. We got our glowing ferrofluid lava lamp. We have a plasma orb that I don't have the converter to connect in right now, but I think I could grab the converter inside in a minute. And we have a bunch of candles, small candles, but they will do the trick at illuminating the darkness once that strikes very quickly. Due to all of the buildings and trees around this, you'll notice that the darkness hits almost all of a sudden. There will be a point in the stream where you're like, oh, it's getting mildly dark. And then five to 10 minutes after that, you're going to be like, whoa, we're lighting up candles because it's really dark. We will chat before we jump into our main mathematical topics, which are going to be some knots that we're going to look at some of the simpler of the non-trivial and even the trivial knots. And we are going to look at a few more weird fractions in a little more depth that have strange cycles. And we're going to try and solve a mystery about one of these fruits that this fruit is not mysterious. I know where this came from. Might be mysterious to you. But to me, I know where this came from. I'll explain it. It is called a loquat and it came from about 30 feet from where we are right now. This... I'm not sure where it came from, and there's a slight mystery behind. So we're going to get into that as well. And one other fun topic that we're going to try is, I don't know exactly how I stumbled into this, but it can be fun to see false proofs of things, and it can be fun to see strange pseudoscience that was believed back in the day. And a combination of that is that I saw that there's in the public domain such that I have an, a PD or I don't know if you call it a PDF, the words of it, the words of the book, maybe just in text form. I have the text of a very old book that I'll be comfortable going through because it's old in public domain. That is about somebody's supposed 100 proofs 
that the earth can't be a globe and must be flat. I mean, it's titled that the earth can't be a globe, which is, you know, we could say if an oblate spheroid is different than a globe. Whoa, did a clock fall or something? Okay, we'll put that one back up. When the wind goes, sometimes the clocks fall. Now, uh, well, it's true that you could define globe in a way that the Earth is not a globe, but what they mean by these hundred proofs is that the Earth is flat, and you can tell that they're running out of steam and running out of proofs by the time they get past the halfway mark because they start to stick in some proofs that are a little nonsensical. I mean, obviously, all 100 proofs will be false because the Earth is much closer to a globe than is flat. But uh, it's funny how they also get worse with the proofs as they have to fill in 100 like they decided was going to be the goal. So, ooh, the cat is back. Well, one of them. This is actually Sassafras. Sassafras, where are you going? Sassafras. So Sassafras is a sweetheart. He was adopted very recently, about a year ago, and he visited the yard a bit before that. And there's a long backstory I'll go and do sometime of how he could be related to the two brothers that we did adopt as our first main two cats. And he's somewhere around their age. We don't know. We got him fixed at the vet after he visited long enough and we adopted him. But then he had some missing hair and we had to sneak feed him steroids and these little pill things to make his thing go away and his hair grow back. But his hair is growing back and he's also such a sweetheart. He was like feral acting, would not let anyone near him for a while. And now he will come and like cuddle in the bed when he's in the right mood. He's a little angel. So somebody says, uh, the other main streaming platform will not let me multi-platform stream and has no ways for streamers to gain views. Now, I am planning on doing some streams on Twitch for fun, but it's because I want to do more casual streams that the YouTube ones I do, which I'll still do, are ones I upload as videos after. And so I try and stay relatively on topic, including a lot of facts, sticking somewhat to the vein of an educational channel. I'm gonna try more casual streams on other platforms, which will probably be Twitch, to cut down the better bits on YouTube. And for people who wanna go there, they can. It's mostly because I want to have more streams where I don't worry about copyright in what is in a permanent video on my channel. And I make all these streams videos after the fact. They're on the tab that says live, but it's basically a video form of the stream that if you wait more than half a day after the stream, we'll also have the chat next to it. And on other platforms, which will probably be Twitch just to have fun and mess around on there. And I will cut any crucial bits that are notable down for YouTube. I won't worry about copyright as much because I don't care if they like ban the channel or whatever. I, I care about my YouTube channels remaining pure from all of the annoying copyright strikes and stuff. I wouldn't care as much when I'm messing around on other platforms. I actually, not many people know, but there's a, I post all the, sh I haven't been doing it as thoroughly recently, but I typically post all the shorts that I put on my channels here, also on TikTok. And there's 50,000 followers on the Combo Class TikTok page. So I have done stuff on other apps too, but YouTube will always be my favorite. Don't worry, YouTube lovers. It's definitely the one that I watch in my free time the one that I want my platform, my content to be on at the end of the day, but I might mess around on some other streams. I'll make a video updating any of those things if I make any changes, but you know, the streams are always the more casual end of the content that could fluctuate in form or where it is. The most important thing to look out for are my main videos on my combo class channel the next of which will be coming out sometime this weekend and will be about a more thorough explanation of something we saw on the other stream in almost real time, a discovery mathematically of new findings being published about 
Do I have the shape? This, that, where's the shape? Okay, I don't know where it went. Okay, some shapes that you'll see in the episode. I swear the shape, the level one, the hat shape was around here somewhere. Okay. So <laughs> you'll see in the episode uh, a more thorough explanation of what does it mean to be a tiling? What does it mean to be in a periodic tiling? Uh, the first level that was discovered known as Penrose tilings. I mean, there was one before that I'll mention, but that a good historic moment of Penrose tilings. And then two different discoveries that were revealed to the public only this year. One that was in March and one that was in May. So, thank you to everybody who is around and commenting. And I am going to set up our background as having some cool stuff in it as we transition over toward the knots and stuff I want to show. Let's start with just a few random graphs while I set up the candles. And the graph I wanted to show is sometimes it's fun to iterate things like sine or tangent uh, trigonometric functions along with x's and y's in an equation and see what it graphs into. And here I have a graphing calculator, for example. And if I graph like y equals sine x, that's like this sine wave curve. If I graph sine of y equals sine of x, I get this. Now we're like, okay, that's a diagonal square, but it doesn't have a side length of one unit. It has a side length of pi units. And in fact, if I multiply a pi in each of these, I neutralize it out. And now it has a side length of one unit. But I wanted to show when we go sine of x over sine of y, first let's start with that equaling sine of y over sine of x. Now this is what I mean by iterating a bit. We've gone a few layers deep with the sign, and all I did is decide here, this is my first half, here I'm gonna flip whatever the variables are. I put X up there, Y down there, we'll flip them. Look at that beautiful shape. Now, the fuzzy bits are where the graphing calculator can't handle it. I'll get a more high depth graphing calculator someday, People have recommended GeoGebra. At least the main version of GeoGebra I downloaded is worse at doing these. So this is our best bet for free software for now, but I'll try other stuff later. Now, the fuzzy bits are where there's infinite density of craziness, so it can't comprehend it. These are the bits where it knows there's a clear line of points that fit that equation and big zone of points that don't. But what if we make it an inequality, less than or equal? Whoa. All right. Now, that's cool, but we can go deeper. What if I say I'm going sine of y over x? I put another x down there. Ooh, now we have a flower sort of blossoming to the side. What if I do the same here with the flip, y over x? Ooh, now we have this strange blooming flower that when you zoom out, looks like these strange pathways or like conical shaped strange corridors or cones or something. There's a lot of ways your eyes might interpret this because, you know, eyes like turning things into recognizable shapes and graphs have all sorts of recognizable shapes hidden in them. So, you know, your eyes could see all sorts of things in these. <clears throat> what if we go a little deeper and we call these sine of X and sine of Y at the bottom? Whoa, that's dense. We gotta go in to see the normal bits. We've gone too crazy, too many fuzzy bits. Backtrack, backtrack. What we're gonna do instead of adding more signs is change some of these signs to tangents. Tangents do their own wacky things. 
Look at these strange waves. So, this was some of the new graph stuff I was fiddling around with, but part of why I wanted to do this was actually just to put on a cool background, which I'm going to go back to a more classic one. These tans are a little crazy. They're good, but the signs were doing us well. Now, we'll keep this funky looking thing up there for a moment while... I'll grow myself a bit, and we're going to set up some candles, because I know the darkness is going to hit really soon, and although the computer light can illuminate stuff, we're going to want some candles. So, we're going to need to assemble a little army of candles, and we'll put them not right next to the electronics, don't worry. We'll put them close enough that they give light. And... If we really need, the screen going to maximum brightness will help as well. But the candles are a more fun, interesting way to light up our scene. We're not going to necessarily use all these. We're just getting a little army of potential candles ready. Now, let's see. Somebody's saying no sound. Hopefully... Other people are getting sound, and that's just a weird glitch or something. Let me know if people are having any trouble with the sound or anything. But what we're going to look at next real quick is... I'll pull up the knots pretty soon, but I think first what I want to do is put on or show you guys... The strange little saga of a weird fruit that emerged around here. So, I'm actually going to go up for a moment and look at just this screen. Go up in terms of the corner right there. And note an interesting little saga with these fruits. So, a lot of fruits are starting to get ready around my front yard that I share with neighbors. But we got plenty of fruits to share and eat and around the side in strange corridors. For example, you folks know this side of the combo classroom really well. This side you got your staghorn fern, that side you got your combo class, and here as we go past the staghorn fern, you ever seen that corridor? Well I've been saving that corridor somewhat because I have an episode that'll work well to use that corridor in a shot. But beyond that corridor back there, there is a loquat tree. It's in one of my shorts, I think. So this is a loquat that was picked technically in the yard right there. And it's the less mysterious one to me. But I don't know if all of you know a loquat. So we're going to do a really quick snack break before I explain the more mysterious one. You can eat the peel. It is probably going to be part of my edible peel conspiracy episode. Good to know which fruits it's totally fine to eat the peel. But we're going to peel it because it's often better that way. And it's a strange tropical fruit with, or tropical tasting at least, with large seeds. But a really good taste. And the loquat's a cool one. I don't know if any of you have had that. But I can incorporate it into some footage in our next snack break because there's a pretty tall tree. I got to use like a stick or yeah, stick like thing to knock them off, try and grab them when they fall. But it's pretty good. Now, what about the more mysterious fruit? So this thing, it's a little plum like thing. I found it in the like potato inhabited planter right there. In that planter with a bunch of good soil in it, I stuck some potatoes and they just started sprouting and making that green stuff. I, I'm curious to see if they make potato fruits, which are technically poisonous and we'll have to be very careful about. But this thing fell into there and I mean, I assume fell. The other option is that a squirrel brought it there 
like a squirrel picked it up and then was like, this isn't a nut, I don't want this, and left it in there. That's the only other thing I can imagine other than that it fell from one of these trees. And when I thought about these trees more, there has been plum trees that were in the neighbor's yard and or our yard when we first moved here many years ago that had plums that look kind of like this. And these trees have been hanging above us the whole time in the combo class, and they haven't had plums. I would have known. But sometimes fruit trees are weird and like don't fruit every year or only fruit parts of the branch or under certain conditions. And when I looked really closely up there, I thought I could see another. I don't know if you'll be able to see this. I thought I could see another right up there. Tell me if you think you can see one. Now, that means that if I can somehow get this tree to fruit more, this could be a plum tree that was above us the whole time. That would be awesome. But I'm also a little hesitant because I'm not positive it's the type of plums that do. There are plums like this that grow naturally around the Bay Area where I live that could be this. But I'm a little hesitant to take a bite. So if we got any botanists who want to convince me whether it's safe to take a bite out of this, leave a comment. But I don't think we're going to do the taste test today. I need to somehow look it up more. It just appeared in the planner. And I feel like it came from that thing because I see a lookalike up on the branch. But that's weird because I haven't gotten plums here in the past. So who knows? Now, before we light all the candles, we also got to note that... This ferrofluid thing, which has just been chilling here in lava lamp form. Remember, it's not just a lava lamp. This thing is rather interesting. Do you see how it's attracting to this and forming a blob? Well, it's a spiky blob even. Ferrofluid, a wild magnetic material that can get spiky and strange. Yeah. Okay, now this forms spheres, right? When you undo it and it's not being magnetized, it forms spherical like shapes. So the Earth's probably gonna do that when you have like planets in an outer zone. However, later in this stream, we're going to read somebody's supposed 100 proofs that the Earth is flat. Which, you know, would be similar to trying to prove that you're on one of these little blobs and it's actually flat. Now, somebody said it might be Prunus sericifera. Uh, Let's look up the uh, plant that they think it might be because... There's this one type of plum tree that grows a lot where I am, and maybe it's the Prunus serifera. Now, let's see. Do folks think... I don't think this is the one in the combo classroom. I don't... Or maybe. Those look... Yeah, those look kind of like the blossoms that fall. It does look like it could possibly be this. All right, folks who watch the background of the videos really carefully, let me know if you think the tree in the background's been this. And then I'll, I'll, I'll probably take a bite of it later. I know I'm saying that like I'm hesitant to, but if I look up a little more data, it's probably still gonna be inconclusive. And then I'm probably gonna be sure enough to try and take a bite, which of course I'll have to recommend no one copies. But, I've eaten prunes, uh, plums that are like that. In fact, so the neighbor used to have one of these trees of what I think it is. And the tree draped into our yard. And I can't tell the entire story quite yet. That's like a grade negative three story or something. And it's, a, you know, got some details and stuff. But in short, when one of my friends was climbing to get plums that were hanging into our yard, but you had to climb onto a fence to get, 
and plucking them and then going back into the window to hand them to me. Our neighbor thought that I was breaking into my house. He saw someone, cl or that the friend was, he saw someone climbing into the window and called the police. And these armed three cops with these massive guns showed up and came to the window and were like, meet me at the door. Do you, what is the deal? You live here, da da da. And then the neighbor was very apologetic when he realized that it was just my friend. But yeah, so there's a crazy story I'll tell more details about someday about one of these plum trees in the past about 10 years ago. So now somebody asked if I'm going to read all 100 proofs when we do the flat earth thing. Probably not. We will skim through them and we will read 42 in the honor of Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, like they mentioned. Great series. Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy is an excellent book series. Now, I got the candles ready, so, and a lighter here, so I think we're ready to go on those and we can talk about a few knots before we need to light these things. Leave any other comments, but for now, what we're gonna do is pull open one of these Wolfram demonstrations. So you remember the site Wolfram is a resource that's good in terms of math. They have a good online graphing calculator. They have this thing called Math World that's sort of Wikipedia-esque. And they also have a place for other people to submit in, you know, like Creative Commons-ish ways. We will, I, you know, I don't like using other people's stuff without crediting, crediting them. So we'll try and remember to look at the name of each person when we pull open their thing. But people put open their things to be available to the public on this place called Wolfram Demonstrations that are like little programs that are interactive, that we can fiddle around with things. And so a good stream topic once in a while is I download like five or six of those that are cool and test them out and then decide to show them to you folks on a stream. And one of these that we're going to do relates to, like I said, knots. Now, it's mathematical knots. And I've made a short about mathematical knots once. And we'll do an episode on the Combo Class channel about them in more depth at some point. In particular, we're going to look at prime knots, which is a unique idea because prime does not always mean the numbers 2, 3, 5, 7, etc. Prime can mean the type of numbers that have a building block in a structure, the way that those numbers have multiplicative, multiplicatively with whole numbers. So there is a thing called prime knots, which isn't like knots with two, three, five, or seven crossings or whatever. It's knots that are the building block simplest ones that others can be unwound into combos of. So with a knot, what does it mean mathematically to be a knot? I believe this might be a torus knot. This toroflux is technically some sort of knot because it has, it's one thread. I mean, if it was thin enough that it was one dimensional and I was still able to do this, it would be a knot. Here's the deal. Mathematically, you need to take things to the extremes and knots are one dimensional threads looped around 3D space. And that's one of the weird things is that it's like, whoa, 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 where, where'd the middle dimension go? Why are you going two dimensions higher? You got a 1D thing and you're looping it through 3D space. And the reason is because if you loop a 1D thing through 2D space, you have these overlaps and stuff that in 3D space could be intertwined in different options that create different tangles. Now, this thing has a few states it can be in. The Toro Flux. And other knots can be unwound into other knots. And so... Since I could turn any closed loop into all sorts of different ways of scrunching it up and winding it, we assume these knots are utterly flexible and stretchable. They're just, it's the way in which the string is tangled. So to note, shoelaces are not mathematical knots. These are, uh, you know, it's like a string that's tied together, not a knot. A knot has to be a closed loop that's entangled in itself in some way. But here's the thing, a lot of simple ones, if you try and scrunch up, I need like a rubber band or something. 
How about this? Pretend this is shut, this old watch. Pretend there's a sealed loop and that it's one dimensional. I could tangle it up and, okay, can't do it. I could scrunch it all around and stuff. But if I don't cut it or like teleport it or anything like that, then I can unwind it back into this form. Unless it was like already open and I move it. If it's a sealed loop that was once rubber bandish, no matter how I scrunch it up, I can unwind it back into the rubber bandish. So we're gonna define knots often, there's many ways they can be categorized as the simplest form they can have, the least scrunched state in terms of some property, such as how many times they cross. Like if I have, um, well, we're gonna need some pictures, let's get these pictures. Shout out to whoever made this demonstration called Knots with Fewer Than 10 Crossings. Now, this is the unknot I was talking about. One sec. There's the unknot I was talking about. So, it has a name. We can also make this one called the trefoil knot. Now we can bend this around and see what's going on. I can also make the radius thinner, smaller. What does T do here? Ooh, that like deletes some of it for some reason. That's how much of it is built. Uh, we can make it less opaque. So this is a really good way of visualizing some of these made by Enrique Zeleni. So shout out to Enrique, or however you pronounce that. And here we have a trefoil knot. This thing is the simplest way I could unscrunch this type of knot in terms of crossings. The crossings are at the simplest way I could like shine a tool through it. How many times does it cross? And even if I line them up on top of each other, I have to count them as different crossings. And this thing can only go down to three crossings. And here's the cool thing. If we look at Whereas I'm going to find this sequence on the OEIS. If I look at 1003, this is probably going to pull it up. It's going to be one of these. Where's the knots? Hmm. Okay. Where's knots? It's something along those lines. Oh, no, 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 it's 1001. I was thinking three because we're on level three. It's, uh, we only have one knot of that sort. That's going to be hard to find here. 1001. How many prime knots are there? Okay. Or even just none. Okay. So like here we have number of knots, prime or composite, with n crossings, because we haven't gone into what prime knots mean. And if we look at the list of them, no crossings has one knot, the unknot. Three crossings has one knot, the trefoil knot. But you have no knots with two crossings or one crossing at their minimal state. There is no way to make a like tied together looped. However, at, like to make it, you can cut it, loop it around, and retape it or whatever. But once it's assembled, there's no way to make one that can, at its minimal state, as one or two crossings, without also being able to get down to the unknot and being unwound. The simplest non-trivial knot, because the unknot, uh, this fella, where is the unknot? The unknot when we puff it outward looks like a torus, but it's not necessarily the only thing called a torus knot. There's, that's a type of knot. But here, if we look at the unknot on the sequence, where were we? That's the uh, trivial knot, they call it. And then there's only one. The simplest other one is the trefoil knot with three crossings. Then we have one with four crossings, two with five crossings, and continues upward. And it looks like they don't even know exactly how many have nine crossings. There's a lot of undiscovered territory in how many knots 
and how many prime knots within that, and questions like that exist under certain metrics, like how many crossings you have at your minimal state. And there's a lot of zones, apparently on this chart, even after eight, that are unknown. Here's prime knots, and they know more about those. I guess they weren't sure about all the composites as much on here. But the prime knots, even if they know these, they don't seem to know 20. Normally, these lists would go further than that. So a lot of open terrain in knot theory for anyone who wants to mess around with these. Now, here's our trefoil. And there's only that's one way of having three crossings at minimal. And there's one way of having four. Here's four. Yep. That's pretty cool. There's my four crossing fella. Oh, cat's up in the tree. They like to do that sometimes. That was crazy, Sage. Sage. They are crazy climbers. Now, here, let's go to the five knot. And this is only the first five knot. There's one that looks like this. You see, we got like almost like a star. And then there's one that's different. Yeah. So this one's neat. It's like the less expected five knot. Like I feel like if you sat down and were told to come up with the five knots under these challenges, you'd probably come up with this one first. And then it might take you a while to come up with this one. So a lot of different views we can try and give it. Now there's also you see what this one looks like, kind of star-like, where they like loop around like a five-pointed star? We're going to get like a version of that, sort of, for all of the odd ones. And here, for example, is like seven loop-arounds. Here, for example, is nine loop-arounds. But those aren't the only ones after a certain... They're sort of like trefoil knots, extra looped. But... There's so many more. Look how many eights there are. Like, we didn't even need to go to eight to have a crazy variety. Let's look at the um, three sixes. This is one way of doing six. Uh, this is another way of doing six. And this is another way of doing six. These are cool. Now let's get a clearer view, view that we can't drag around, but that will be a slightly clearer like onset view of them by looking at um, pictures of knots, pictures of mathematical knots, not the other type of knots. Now, Here's a list of mathematical knots under one way of drawing the picture. There's a Wikipedia picture. They also have, um, they had a really good picture of the prime knots. So look at these. These are the prime knots. Trefoil, figure eight. Do, 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 do. And these are the ones we had up because we were able to decompose those ones. So these are the same ones we were fiddling around with on our app. Now here's the funny thing on the knots diagram. Sometimes they stop having a picture for one, but they like happen to have a picture of it in a different thing. Like this is probably some other historical thing. They're like, okay, cool. We have a picture for seven, four. We'll use that thing. And it happens more and more here. They're like, okay, we'll use the liney ones we had. Okay. We had this thing. Okay. Let's keep going. We had that thing that are technically, uh, this correct knot. These ones we got. Now we're like, okay, we'll fill in another one with the blue thing. We didn't have another drawing of it. We had this. And then as you go down, you start to miss some pictures. And then they like happen to have a few of them. It's still cool that you have all these different sorts of pictures that could resemble the knots. I mean, they fully represent the knots. Now these are links, links are different. Those are when you have multiple things connected. Uh, in fact, there's Borromean rings are a fun one we should pull up. 
I have a little... I think I downloaded the Baromian Rings one. Let's see. Yeah. So these are called Baromian Rings. I'm going to try and build these in real life for an episode sometime. So these are three rings that when we look at them... Okay, and this one was made by Michael Schreiber. Shout out to Michael. And... Here we have three li links that were connected. And if I imagine these are actual links, these show up in one of my fiction books. So, you know, you got to be tuned for clues if you see something like this in one of my books because they're going to come out in pieces. You're going to have to piece together the web. You might see a Baromian ring here and there. Now, if you have three rings like this and you tried to pull any apart, they would be stuck. Like, imagine I pull the orange out it's stuck on like both of them in a way it seems and it's at least not able to get untangled each of them is caught on the combo of the other however if i remove one of them the other two are not uh intertwined and that's true for any of these if i remove any one of these the other two are not connected. But when I put them all together in that exact same fashion, the combo of three makes them connected. So it's not like a trick or anything. It's mathematically true, Baromian rings. You got three connected shapes, but if any of them were removed, the other two would not be connected or interlinked. Now, that's pretty neat. That's a little side one. And one that that reminds me of is this cool one that I also downloaded about a triangular braid. This actually reminds me weirdly of dice because I have an episode about dice that involves a way of visualizing that this almost reminds me of, even though it's very different. For some reason, it reminds me of dice. You'll see why in the future uh, when we look at a certain type of dice in an episode. Now, these are all interlocked, but if I remove one of them, then the other two are not interlocked. They're basically Baromian rings in a tangly way with these three colors. So, those are fun. Oh, wait, who made that one? I do want to shout out all the people. So, this one was made by... Uh... T. Vernhoff. And this was just in that book? Okay. I guess they got this from a certain book or something. Now, oh no, Tom, Tom Verhoff. Okay, cool. So, those are fun things. Now, we do have other knots that we can play around with on this particular app. And pretty soon it's getting dark. I need to run and use the bathroom real quick. But what I'm going to do first is, just in case it attracts a squirrel, let's open some of the bird seed that I have extra. Put a little bird seed over there where I'll point the camera. So that. And we'll leave this thing in the background because it looks cool. We'll see if we can see a squirrel while I have to take like a two minute break, run inside. This bird seed could attract anyone. If anyone runs away, Make sure that either you come back in a few minutes or if you're gone for the day, check all the links in the description. Uh, there are some shorts. If you're bored squirrel watching while I'm gone for a minute, uh, make sure you've seen all six shorts on the Combo Class channel so far. I've been trying to share shorts with that channel because they did way too absurdly well on this channel. And the shorts algorithm really cares about how many shorts a certain channel has put out. I put the most random one on this channel it's at 2 million. I even saw, okay, I saw this weird thing from a tweet from like a celebrity-like person that, or like a big random person in a certain sphere that seemed like they maybe had seen my video and were accidentally referencing it. It was about my the 11 trick. I need to show that in a bit. But when I put all the shorts on the combo class channel, they didn't get many views because the algorithm really cares about how many shorts you've put on it so far. So make sure that you give the shorts on the combo class channel some love too.
because I need all the random people from the Shorts app to know about that channel too, where my best projects go. Now, I love you all. We're going to leave this up for a minute. Maybe you'll see a squirrel in the background. We'll also get this into frame. And I'll be back in two or three minutes. And um, we will continue, maybe go on to our fraction segment. Although I'll probably have a little more to say about knots as well. I'll probably have to light all these candles as well. Whoa, why is that flickering? It's not plugged in fully or something. Okay. Do, do, do. Hello. Any squirrels or anything cool? Maybe not. So, somebody said RIP Patrice O'Neill. Um, is that a guy who died recently that rings a bell on something? I need to look something up real quick. He died 2011. Um, I'm not sure, but that was about Patrice O'Neill. Cool, I think. Don't know that much about it. So, um, thank you for everybody who has joined me here. Hope you're all doing well. Somebody said it would be. Somebody said, "Are these allowed to be untangled?" You're allowed to untangle a knot by winding it or melding it like it was clay that's stretchy but you're not allowed to cut it or say teleport one of these strands past the other. So if there's a bit that I could unwind around another by stretching it, that works, but I cannot cut it. So, oh, somebody said, what's the number 42 knot thingy? They're like the number 42 because Hitchhiker's Guide. Here's one called 942. 
this knot is called 942 so there you go now um, somebody said that a number file crossover would be cool I am totally down I have some excellent ideas that are saved for future grades of combo class that are also do for number file instead if Brady ever wanted to do that who runs number file I would be more than down so you know people could always suggest that in a casual way you know make sure number file knows combo class is a cool thing without bugging anybody now this is called knot theory the study of mathematical knots so if anybody wanted to do any additional research a few simpler ways when you want to jump into something it's not bad to just read what wikipedia has to say about it such as the list of prime knots as well as they have pages in general about knot theory and about what it just means to be a mathematical knot. Even articles about particular knots, such as the trefoil knot. This one's so classic. This one is the simplest non-trivial knot, but it has three crossings at its simplest. Three vins! So. Lot of trefoil knots and cultural symbols as well. People like that one. And a lot of other classic knots. These are some ones that have been used in history a lot. Well, I don't know about if that one's been used in history a lot, but it's cool. There's a wild type. You know what I mean by wild type? I literally mean there's a type called wild knots and wild knots are a whole nother story we'll make an episode about these things someday now knot theory is its own sort of interesting realm of math that you can define with numbers but it's essentially a topological thing where if you look at the field in general of I'm allowed to move things around. I'm allowed to try and untangle them and stretch them, but I'm not allowed to actually cross them over and I have certain restrictions like that. Uh, it's sort of looking into what topology looks at, where we can sort of morph around shapes in different dimensions and see which ones become each other. However, knot theory can also become numbers so a lot of these things that are easiest to visualize with shapes do have numbers within them but for example how many prime knots there are not a known equation so there are many mysteries in there i mean how many prime knots for a given amount of crossings don't know the, if there's an equation or what it is to that so somebody says psa always specify mathematical knot so yes, we got cultural knots too, like shoelaces and stuff. So yeah, we're talking about a knot that's mathematical. I did say near the beginning, we're talking about 1D loops in 3D space when we talk about knots. This Toro Flux, if the edges were 1D, is a mathematical knot. Now the interesting thing is, where's the minimal amount of crossings? I guess is here. 13 crossings or 14 or something like that. It's a little paradoxical when you look at the crossings on different lenses, but the minimal I think is 13, maybe 12, uh, of how many crossings we can get this down to. Now, or maybe more, maybe twice that. I don't know. I would have to look at the actual knot this forms. Leave a comment if you know what the Toro flux would be if it was one dimensional. Now, thank you to all the nice comments. I wanted to pull open one more demonstration here before we get into candlelit mode. And the other demonstration is going to be about some wacky fractions. Now we're gonna have to do a really quick refresher of something that I mentioned in a previous stream and video about how one seventh is wacky. And that's cause we're gonna see some other friends of it. So for everyone who knows the one seventh stuff, don't worry, I just got to give a little refresher. We'll also clarify some of our terms where I tried to be clear about this whenever I've talked about it, but it's there's a few things that are called cyclic numbers, so I don't really like that term for these because cyclic numbers is a term that's used for other stuff in math too. 
Let's actually just go to this for a second. I'm going to move my head off screen for a moment. Now, one seventh is what can be called a full reptend prime. That's one of the names that's specific enough we know what we're <clears throat> talking about, a full reptend prime. And it's a type that creates a cyclic number within it. The cyclic number in this context, which can also mean something else in group theory, is a number that is a certain amount of digits that when you multiply it by its first multiples up to what's called its generator, the denominator of this fraction, then we get it shifted. One, four, two, eight, five, seven. Two, five, seven, eight, four, one, four. It's all the same string shifted around. One, four, two, eight, five, seven. One, four, two, eight, five, seven. One, four, two, eight, five, seven. As I showed, it goes deeper. This is the part that everyone shows. The part nobody shows is that we can add these up to 99 and 999 in crazy ways. 142 plus 857 is 999. 285 plus 714 is 999. 428 plus 571, 999. You get the same thing for all these. Uh, 14 plus 28 plus 57, 99. 28 plus 57 plus 14, 99. This one overflows, but is a multiple of 99. So uh, it gets really crazy when you look at these. And as I've hinted, we are going to do a full episode about these before too long. But the key feature for that magical nines trait is not even that it has to be a full reptend cyclic prime. Uh, it's just that it needs to have a repeating decimal with an even amount of digits in the string. Then we get this weird property that's really cool. Now, luckily, all of these full reptend primes are primes, so the number that we're, um, let's see. The number one less than these is always going to be the cycle length in this case, because that's why they call it a full rep tend or long rep tend or stuff prime, is that its period is as long as a repeating period can be. In any decimal system, like base 10 or whatever, the period that repeats, if you have a repeating period for a fraction, can only be up to one less than the denominator assuming we're using whole numbers and stuff for the fraction. So, I mean, for the numerator and denominator of the fraction, obviously the whole thing's not a whole number. Now, here are the next one, 17. I actually showed in my last stream, 13 will be an example we'll use as well when we make an episode about this, because although it doesn't have the same cyclic property of going all 12 digits repeat for every 1 13th, 2 13ths and such, because essentially, just to make sure it's sunk in for everyone, this string is called the cyclic number, but if we put zero point in front of it, it's one seventh. And since multiplying that by two is this, then zero point that is two sevenths. Zero point that one is three sevenths, and so on. Now, okay, Siren, we're good, we get it. Now, We'll assume they're saving somebody and it's for the and it's for a good purpose. Now, the 13 does almost as cool stuff. It has two six digit strings that sort of alternate, but it's not all 12 repeating for 13. However, 17 has a 16 digit string that is cyclic. And so that 16 digit string can be considered in the next cyclic number in base 10 if we allow a zero in front. If we only allow ones without the zero to be part of the cyclic number in front, then actually one seventh is the only one in base 10. But here we have a cyclic number that has a zero, and if we allow that, then it works. That's one times it, they didn't put the zero there, twice it, so basically two seventeenths would be zero point that, three seventeenths would be zero point that and etc. That they skip the zero, but zero one seventeenth 
is 0 0.0588. We see the zero up there. Now, this is a cyclic number, and it does the nine thing. Look, you take half of it, plus the other half is two numbers. It's a string of eight nines, because that's half the period. Take half of that, half of that, half of that, any of these. Let's pick a random one. We'll go to the seventh one. Uh, what number is that? 41,176,470 plus 58,823,529. 99,999,999. Crazy. So that's the best trait that not enough people show about what is sometimes called cyclic numbers here. We can do it with all these ones on the list. So we don't have 42 like somebody was wanting us to do stuff with. But leave a comment if you have any other particular cyclic number you'd like to see. Now, we'll just pull open one for a second. And let me grab my stuff to get the candles ready because I think we're almost at that time. Leave a comment if there's another cyclic number you want to see or what else you notice about what we can do with 19 Because here's the thing. I'll give you a clue. There's an 18-digit string. Start with one. this one maybe because, or imagine this has a zero in front. This 18-digit string, or, or you could try with these follow-ups, but this will do it extra well. See what happens when I divide it in half and add that nine-digit number with that nine-digit number? What happens when I divide it into other factors? When I make a six-digit number plus a six-digit number plus a six-digit number? And what happens when I make three-digit numbers plus each other or two-digit numbers plus each other? Let me know in a comment. Let me grab some stuff for our fire. Whoops, had that off for a second. Hopefully we can get me going again there. We're going to put a sacrificial clock so that we can illuminate this zone in advance of the darkness striking very soon. And we're going to put a bunch of candles on the clock. And what we're going to do is let's honor the different times. Let's put one candle for each 12. Oh, there's a cat here. Cat. Hi. Oh, it's Sagey Boo. Hi, Sage. That's a good Sage. They love helping out back here. I love them. Now, here we have one candle per hour. Now, I'm going to someday, one of my main goals for things I would like to change about the world someday, this is one of the more trivial goals, but clocks should have a zero on top, not a 12. So, okay, we'll get into that more over time. I, that is, you know, if I ever sell some sort of merch, it'll be the better clock. Now, we get all these wicks facing up. Hopefully this will be a nice little circle of illumination to light up the rest of the episode. We can also get a slightly cursed vibe. Too bad we already talked about 666 enough the other day. Some people commented other facts that I didn't put in that particular video, such as roulette wheels have numbers from 0 to 36, which add up to 666, making some think there is a superstitious aspect to roulette wheels. There might as well be. You'll lose money on those. If you go to a casino, you know, feel free to have fun at a casino, but don't a roulette wheel or a slot machine is not the way to go. Now, I mean, anything at a casino, you're going to lose your money, but... It, best case scenario, you could play poker against people and lose less money. Or, you know, if you're really good at blackjack, then you're not losing much money. On average, <laughs> the casino is still going to win. Uh, so it might as well be cursed. But uh, 
I'm mostly joking about it because, you know, it's a dark humor thing because some people actually have gambling problems, which makes it the dark part of the humor. However, there's also something kind of funny about the way that casinos rig and trick people. And got to be careful. Uh, I've had fun betting with my friends, and I've occasionally had fun at casinos, but eh, not the funnest thing in the world. Now, it's getting pretty dark, as we can see. And like I said, the darkness is going to strike all of a sudden. So, somebody said something's not a safe for work lookup. I'm not sure what you're saying is mathematical not or whatever. Um, not sure what you're referring to. Um, but thank you to all of the nice comments for all of my combo lords. Now, I think that's most of the Wolfram demonstrations that I had. I did have a few other graph variations we could try, and we're going to probably pull out the graphs a little bit later. For now, what I want to do, is, and actually, let's get one more cool thing in the background. There's another awesome, I, the stand is elsewhere, but here is the item. Quicksand painting. This thing um, illuminates. No, no, this thing illuminates, and I want it in the frame. This thing slowly drips down this sand and will be a fun background little item before it's time that we need to light the candles. We're going to chat for a moment about what's coming up in combo class and what happened this mo uh, last month leading up to whatever where we're at. And then as it fully strikes dark, we'll light the candles, get spooky for a second, and probably pull open some graphs later. Now, what's coming next is, like I said, this weekend we'll have an aperiodic monotile episode where I want to explain further the discoveries that mathematicians had not only a few months ago that I'm surprised haven't been covered somewhere like number file yet, but the even newer discoveries that happened like a week and a half ago. So that will be tucked into our episode. It's pretty quick. You know, it's not like the deepest dive of all time. It's like a 13, 14 minute episode or something, but it's going to be a quick look at the history of what it means to be an aperiodic tiling and what they discovered this month. Now, well, technically at this point last month, what they discovered and what they published in some of it in March and even newer stuff in May. Now, and we're going to look at the lead up to that, like what's called Penrose tilings and mention even one called Wang tiles that were a previous one. Now, after that, there's going to be probably an in-between episode after that that's going to be a little more casual and quick. I'm going to be doing some more quicker, you know, 10 minute little fun math lessons on the main combo class channel of great subjects that I've been saving. But I want to try some shorter episodes mixed in there as well. But one of the longer episodes that I know will be coming out either after the aperiodic monotile or maybe one between will be the 30th anniversary of Fermat's last theorem is coming up. And that was 30 years ago. It was uh, not of when it was Fermat's last theorem was presented. Fermat was not alive 30 years ago. But when the proof that it was solved was first presented was 30 years from a couple weeks from now. And we're going to make an episode for that about the history of Fermat's last theorem, the crazy proof that went into it. And that's actually only half the episode. Uh, you know, for people who don't know about the historical margin note with all this cryptic, you know, years of research, that'll be cool. And I do have, you know, important things to share about it. But the more important half, arguably, will be the second half of that episode, where I go into what other questions remain related to which types of numbers in it's called a field called diophantine equations within number theory of these certain types of equations with you're looking for integer solutions or rational solutions and Fermat's last theorem lines up with some other questions that are still open so we're going to look at other things and i might need to buy more dice because I swear, I've gotten more than a thousand dice because I got a lot of them bulk for cheap once. And I don't know if I can find enough dice for what I need for this episode because I need 200 dice-ish to stack. And uh, we can do the math right now because I've shown on the last stream that a really cool thing that 
I, I'm not going to say what the seed of where this is going in the episode, but leave a comment if you can figure out what I would be doing with this. I'm going to be having, I need 216 dice. So, to use in a particular thing. Now, so I might need to buy more dice, because although I have dice all over the table and stuff, <laughs> dice, dice, dice. Oh, shoot. I don't know if I have 200 accessible ones. A lot of the dice are in the dice carpet, as I call the embedding in the floor. Can't see it with this light much, but there's dice embedded in the carpet. In fact, I want to give you folks a good view because that's coming along really good. I'm going to turn on the maximum brightness here and just see if you can see the dice carpet for a minute. So you see how it's coming along pretty good. All these dice are just straight up embedded in the ground. Oh my God, there's a cat here all along. Hi, Sage. I didn't know you were there. You're just hanging out and helping. Did you guys see Sage? I didn't know he was here all along. Sage was helping us that whole time. He's such a good little boy. Okay. It's getting dark. In about two minutes, I'll light these candles. Maybe I'll eat this cursed dish fruit that it's only cursed because I'm not positive that it's the type of plum I think it is, but it appeared back in that planter recently and probably from the trees above that apparently are rarely fruiting plum trees. So maybe we'll eat the cursed fruit when it gets dark enough too. Now, <laughs> um, hopefully it's not cursed. Hopefully it's a non-cursed fruit. So... <laughs> Uh, leave any comments or questions. The other things that will be coming in combo class apart from those episodes that I've mentioned for Mon's Last Theorem, Monotile, and another one in between probably are going to be... Uh, I want to... It's hard for me to edit them all, so I am looking to work with more editors and such, but uh, I want to convert more of my stream ideas that I have for future streams into some of them being streams and some being bonus videos. I like my bonus videos that I do on this channel. And I don't know if you've noticed, but a lot of them are one take just because I don't want to edit them. I, so I have them just be one clip I can upload that uh, I can trim the ends of a clip really easily if I don't need to splice different clips together. If I do, I need to import something, export something, do a few things. And I'm working on so many other projects, like right now, my monotile episode and stuff, that uh, I don't always have time to do that portion of it. So I, sometimes my bonus videos, I'm like, we have to film these in one take. But as I'm working with more editors, hopefully going forward and various things like that, uh, I'll be able to get more of my ideas as random bonus videos on this channel. This channel is going to start having more random non-mathematical things at times because it is technically my bonus channel and I have a lot of random things I want to make videos out of that are going to go on this channel if they're more on the random end. So for people who are more pure math and science heads, if you ever get bored with this channel, just make sure you're tuned into the combo class channel too. But because that's where like you're going to get a polished project with each episode here. A few things that we may see in the next couple months will include some of my music being released, uh, hints of some of my writings that I want to start releasing in a almost choose your own adventure like format where although you won't get to pick the plot, you might get to pick what you want to see next out of a web of things. And another thing will be field trips where I want to go out into nature and stuff like that. And I wanted to do streams where I could go camping and stuff. I could do that here where I bring the tent back for a night. It could be fun. But I want to go to other natural places where I want to have internet to do a stream. So there might be bonus videos with a stream like vibe in a weird natural spot where I don't have internet to do a stream. And I just am like, okay, we're going to do a 30 minute couple little topics here in this cool natural zone, but I'll upload it after the fact when I'm back in civilization. So I like nature anyway. I want to get out into nature more. 
for those who have been following the arc last year i had to get two major hip surgeries the year before i almost died a lot of crazy stuff and so i've only been able to get to some of my favorite natural locations again quite recently and there are many beautiful trails and such in nature rivers zones out in the forest and such that I love that I've visited many times in the past but haven't visited in a few years and I can't wait to see how they're doing so those you know I'm not going to be able to stream there so we might do some stream-esque bonus videos in some natural zones now it's getting close to dark let's light one candle at a time as it gets darker that'll be fun Let's see if we can get a slightly further view of all of our stuff. Where, move a couple more cubes. Okay, now. We'll light one at a time. And we're starting at the one that says 12, but should say zero. Also a cat's back. Wait, wait, where's the cat? Hey cat. Is it you again, Sage? Hey, Sage. Yeah, it's a good boy. They love coming and helping. They're so awesome. So right now, it might not seem like it's needing to do much. That's partially because my screen brightness is like hyper extra high. If my screen brightness was more normal, it's kind of dark out here and the candle will give us our more natural, actual vibe. Now, of course, this laptop I've learned, if I'm ever candleless, I can turn the screen really bright and you'll be able to still see me as it gets darker. But as it gets darker, we prefer the natural vibe and I kind of want to play around with fire more. I'll probably do that on some of the random streams if I do on Twitch and cut down our better bits. I'm hesitant to put too much fire on YouTube because I don't want that to be a future thing that they get mad about. They've gotten mad at other creators for swearing in like random after the fact events. What if they start getting mad about things being lit on fire? Well, a lot of my episodes, we do that. So I'm not gonna stop lighting things on fire, but uh, I wanna make sure that whenever we light things on fire, I give some sort of disclaimer. That's like, do not copy, do not do any fire just because I'm doing fire, you know? fire dangerous so in this case it's just little candles and so nothing to worry about but in general if you see me do something wild with fire do not copy now uh, I am quite excited for a lot of the ideas that although this month like I said is sort of shape month where we're going to be doing a lot of shape-based episodes, the monotile proofs. For Ma's Last Theorem, doesn't sound like it's about shapes, but when we look at the third power as a lot of examples, we can demonstrate it with cubes, so it's sort of shape-esque. Now, and second power is like Pythagorean triples is the one that actually works, can be demonstrated with shapes quite good. You know, right triangles with integers for sides. But after shape month, I have a lot of really cool number ones ready to go we might do some shorter combo class episodes that are some of these ones i'm planning are more than a week apart because they're a little more elaborate i might do some shorter ones of just some ideas i really want to present and i'm not going to say the topics but what i'm going to say is uh, somebody mentioned Pascal's triangle the other day that will come into play and its relationship with what are called polygonal numbers. Other things that will come into play again are factorials, strange ways that numbers have unique properties, modular arithmetic, threevens, and you know, a lot of the classics. Of course, the classics in new ways. These episodes will be things that have not even... A lot of my combo class episodes, I aim to contain a lot of their information and stuff I've never even said in a stream yet. So, we got a nice little illumination station. That's pretty nice. See, now we don't need to worry about 
trying to churn up some artificial lantern brightness or whatever, we can illuminate the brightness just from here. Now, somebody mentioned, are we going to look at the flat earth thing? And I think it is about time for that. That's a pretty funny thing I wanted to pull up. So, in the land of fake proofs and wrong assumptions, we are going to look at some of those for their mathematical interestingness of how you could get a proof wrong. And you even get a little philosophy out of human over cockiness and human potential for error to be overcommitted to a belief. And so sometimes we'll see that in a mathematical way. There are times where we'll look at, for example, a false proof of the Colette's conjecture or whatever to deconstruct what did the person think they get right mostly on a mathematical sense and partially on a psychological sense. And sometimes they'll cross over into science because pseudoscience is pretty funny. Now, the one of my favorite writers, Martin Gardner, mostly wrote math puzzles, but he did even write a book about various old pseudoscience, people who thought crazy things about, you know, the way that the world works or the body works or such, you know? Gotta be careful, some pseudoscience led to, they used to put leeches on people and stuff. So, gotta be careful what you go with. Now, one classic one is flat earthers. And it's debatable to what degree, how many flat earthers really believe it are out there. That's debatable, it's hard to say because there's some people who are sort of, almost seem like they must be in it for the meme or something. But there are certainly still some people out there who believe it. Now, sometime we'll look at the modern flat earthers and some strange trends of them. But right now we're going to look at a really old fashioned one, partially because I stumbled into this as a public domain thing that I know will, I'll be totally OK putting in the stream because it is from more than 100 years ago. But a book from the late 1800s that was in the time somebody supposed many proofs that people who think the earth is a globe are idiots. Now, by isn't a globe, they aren't meaning it's more of an oblate spheroid than a sphere. They mean they think it's flat. Now, it's kind of funny that when I read that title, it's called 100 Proofs That the Earth is Not a Globe. Now, let me confirm that's the exact title. We'll pull open the book. Let me get it here. This was released in, the version here is 2017, but the book was released in 1885. 100 proofs that the earth is not a globe. So <laughs> that's pretty fun. Cause it's like, whoa, dude, you came up with 100 ways in which you think the earth's flat. Jesus, dude. So the funny thing is, as expected, as you might guess, the first proofs are closer to like, here's something I really believe about the flat earth. And then they sort of run out of ideas when they decided they were going for 100 and not something like 12 or whatever. The, the later proofs sort of lose a little steam. Now, let's look at these proofs. So, this is just the text of the book, which will do the trick now. I love pure text. Nothing wrong with just converted text of a book. If I write a bunch of books and I want people to put them anywhere, I don't care if the text looks like this or looks like what. Text is good. So, the aeronaut, I assume they mean somebody flying a plane or a spaceship, can see for himself that Earth is a plane. The appearance presented to him, even at the highest elevation he has ever attained, is that of a concave surface. This being exactly what is expected of a surface that's truly level, since it's the nature of level surfaces to appear to rise to a level with the eye of the observer. What is he talking about? How is it the nature of level surfaces to appear to rise? If you look at a flat field, it doesn't appear to rise. 
If you're at an angle, it'll go toward the angle. Okay, this is ocular demonstration and proof that the Earth's not a globe. So from the beginning, you're like, okay, that's the best proof he has for number one. Okay, we're in for something real good. Uh, what, whenever experiments have been tried on the surface of standing water, the surface has always been found to be level. If the Earth were a globe, the surface of all standing water would be convex. There's an experimental proof that Earth is not a globe. Okay, I don't think this guy's done many experiments on water himself. Now, we're not going to read every single one of these, but I want to skim through them and see what's the main point of each of these. So, this is about railroads. This one's about rivers don't go down. That's the same fact he said here with the water, which isn't fact in quotes. Okay, lights in lighthouses are seen by navigators at distances, which according to the scale of the supposed curvature given by astronomers, they ought to be many hundreds of feet, in some cases down below the line of sight. For instance, the light at camp, uh, this thing, is seen at such a distance, 40 miles, that according to theory, it ought to be 900 feet higher above the level of the sea than it absolutely is in order to be visible. And according to theory, what theory? This is a good, okay, uh, you gotta like how he's like, according to theory, doesn't say which theory it is, and then says, this is a conclusive proof. According to theory that I shall not name, this is a conclusive proof. Okay, sands of the seashore, and watch a ship approach us. She will apparently rise. Bro, do not mention the seashore. You are going to end your cause. Going to the seashore is the quickest way to see the curvature of the earth. To see that it's not flat. You go to the seashore, you see a boat approach. You, you know how you see the front of the boat in, before the back? You know what that means? The earth's curved. So, <laughs> she will apparently rise to the extent of her own height, nothing more. If you stand on an eminence, the uh, eminence, the same law operates still, and it is but the law of perspective. Yes, perspective works that way on a spherical thing. Okay, this guy apparently took a, peak, a trip down to Chesapeake Bay, probably because he has an exam, or he read about someone who did. Uh, here we got a small model globe would be the very best because the truest thing for what? What are they talking about? What? If the Earth were a globe, a small model globe would be the very best because the truest thing for the navigator to take to see with him. But such a thing as that would is not known. With such a toy as a guide, the mariner would wreck his ship of a certainty. This is proof that the Earth is not a globe. What? Okay, so... Even, we got to deconstruct someday further logical fallacies and stuff like this, because there's multiple levels of logical fallacy. Even if it was true that it being impossible to make a globe is like fully linked with a mariner is going to crash. Just because such a thing is not known so, something being not known isn't proof. Now, in fact, the second level of error here is that we know why it's not known. There is logical reasons why a projection on a... F Actually, no, a globe can be accurate. A flat map can't be accurate. I don't know what he's talking about. He must have read that you can't make a flat map fully accurate by projecting a spherical thing onto flat. But you can make a small model globe. What is he talking about? Maybe they didn't have globes in the late 18, 1800s. They did. So, a lot of good reasons here. Let's see some of the other classics. We're going to go to 42, like someone asked. And there's one other that caught my eye, kind of like that just random assassination of character of humans, where it's like, this is impossible. Humans are too dumb to do this, therefore not globe. One of those that did this over here again is, uh, 
Let's see. There's one where they try and get science into how big stuff is. And they don't like big numbers. Where is it? Where's the big numbers one? They're talking about how big the sun is compared to other stuff in the one I'm about to find here. Okay, so here you ready to hear a proof the Earth's uh, not uh, globy? Considerably more than a million Earths would be required to make up a body like the sun, the astronomers tell us. And more than 53,000 suns would be wanted to equal the cubic contents of the star Vega. And Vega is a small star. Now, I don't know if the, any of this math's still correct or what, but let's assume it's right. Let's assume all their math's right. And Vega is a small star. And there are countless millions of these stars. And it takes 30 million years for the light of some of these stars to reach us. What are these random facts going to add up to? Okay. At 12 million miles in a minute. What? Okay. Anne says Mr. Proctor. I think a moderate estimate... Uh, who's Mr. Proctor? He must have been in an earlier quote. I think a moderate estimate of the age of the Earth would be 500 million years. Its weight, says the same individual, is... Wait, let me count these things. Six... Um, sextillion tons. Six sextillion. That's a pretty good combo. Now, now, since no human being is able to comprehend these things, the giving of them to the world is an insult. An outrage. Okay, so here's where it just starts to become like an assassination of character on not only every human on Earth... But apparently, whatever God the guy believes in, it's okay if someone wants to believe in a God, but this guy seems to believe in a God and think very lowly of it. Now, thinks, since no human being is able to comprehend these things, the giving of them to the world is an insult, an outrage. And although they have all arisen from the one assumption that Earth is a planet, Instead of upholding the assumption, they drag it down by the weight of their own absurdity. And le oh, there's this giant crane fly flying around these flies. I don't know if you know these crane fly things. Uh, arisen from the one assumption that Earth is a planet. Instead of upholding the assumption, they drag it down by the weight of their own absurdity. Oh my God, look at this. Oh my God, it's burning itself. The crane fly just went into the candle and it's burning itself. Oh God, I don't know if you can see that weird bug going... Uh, there's a bug that just flew in my face and then landed in a candle. Sorry, bug. You see this thing? What's going on? Oh, no, no, no. I just wanted to get you out the candle. Oh, no, it's dead, I think. Oh, no, it's alive. It's alive. Okay. Yeah, okay. It doesn't have that much life. Okay, let's try and light the other... Oh, light the other candles with this one. Ow! Okay. Okay, no, I have wax on me now. It's actually not that bad. When me and my friends have done challenge games before, you always can, you know, it's not the end of the world. To... It's only like a little bit hot to get burning wax on yourself. Now, somebody is mentioning the 42. We skipped 42. Uh, but no, no, I need to deconstruct this a little more. Look at this crazy assassination of character on the humans and whatever God they believe in. They say that, since it would be that many big numbers for all of these random traits, where was that? All of these big numbers apply to these random traits they're talking about here. Now, since no human being is able to comprehend these things, the giving of them to the world is an insult, an outrage. So they're just like, it can't be. A proof that Earth is not a globe. They say that since these numbers are so big and a human can't understand those numbers, that it would have been absurd for those numbers to describe what's going on in the universe. Proof that it's not. I guess actually it's thinking kind of highly of humans. 
maybe it's not a roast of humans. Maybe it's actually saying that humans are like hyper godly and whatever they understand defines the universe. So yeah, 42, like somebody requested, says that it's certain that the theory of the Earth's rotundity and that of its mobility must stand or fall together. A proof, then, of its immobility is virtually a proof of its non -ro ro Whoa, 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 where are we going? Okay, so rotundity and mobility must stand or fall together. This is ridiculous theory. This is saying that if the Earth's not moving, it's not round. What? It's just like the most ridiculous premise for this. This is what I mean by double layers of logical fallacy. First of all, yes, the Earth is moving and it's round. Second of all, no, if the Earth wasn't moving, that wouldn't disprove its roundness. So they claim that a proof of the immobility is a proof of the non run And here they say virtually, but here at the end, they're pretty confident just saying, we have a proof. They like to tuck the more casual virtuallys and maybes in the paragraph, but at the end, you always just hear we have proof. In fact, I think every single one of these paragraphs ends with proof that the Earth is not a globe. Proof that the Earth is not a globe. <laughs> proof that the Earth is not. Proof that... Okay. So, 42 goes on to state that now that the Earth does not move, either... On, what are they talking about? It, what do they mean the Earth does not move? If the Earth went through space at the rate of 1,100 miles in a minute of time, as astronomers teach us in a particular direction, there would unquestionably be a difference in the result of firing off a projectile in that direction and in a direction the opposite of that one. But as in fact there is not the slightest difference in any such case, it's clear that any alleged motion of the Earth is disproved, and therefore uh, the quote they love to say, so, yeah, that is one of the proofs that Earth is not a globe. Now, I'm pretty sure the Earth is some other platonic solid shape. Okay. <laughs> now, uh, hold up. I need to get this wax off any part of the computer that I accidentally got a little wax on. Or maybe the crane fly got the wax on. So, now... Uh-oh, what have I done? What have I done? It's just on my end it looks weird. Don't worry on your end. I hope so. Don't worry on your end. So, whatever. Close enough. Now, these are some very interesting uh, errors in human assumption. This person, I do believe, thought that they were sure that everyone in the world, practically, that almost everyone in the world was really dumb and was just like, didn't get that they had been tricked by the society to believe it. So, you know, if you hear somebody trying to convince you, well, I guess I was just saying society's wrong about putting 12s on clocks instead of zeros. Uh, but that, we're going to say that's different. If you hear someone trying to convince you something scientific about the world, not about how culture should act, that is something people should be allowed to recommend, what they think culture could be improved like, but something about the science or mechanics of the universe, don't get too hooked on it, especially if the theory relies on discarding a lot of previous scientific knowledge and that those previous scientific thinkers were wrong. Now, that could be right once in a while, but be careful. We can see with this flat earth guy, it wasn't right in this case. I'm trying to light them off each other. There we go. Oh, no, the crane fly got in that one. The crane fly is fully in this one. Okay. Well, I guess we're going to get wax on the desk. It's that era of the grade. We're about one-sixth of the way through grade negative two, maybe. So, starting to get wax on here. Um, but, let's see. Uh, conspiracies are really interesting like that. Flat Earth, some people still believe it. 
And you can see video footage that it's the type of thing I don't really want to show on YouTube because I'm worried about copyrights and stuff. But maybe sometime we'll look through that footage in some form or somewhere. Uh, of people who have done flat earth experiments doing the, an experiment that concludes that the earth is round and somehow insisting that the data still points their direction or just that one case was wrong and that their case is still right. So there are other theories that more people are hooked by than flat earth that are more dangerous. So, you know, be careful if any theory you ever hear is like, the whole government is lying to you. There's this big scale secret. A lot of that stuff is going to look like this flat earth document in a few years, you know. So I think this is a fun example of that. I'm going to look more through it in my own time sometime and consider whether it's worth a bonus episode or video deconstructing the logical fallacies in it. Uh, we'll go to one more random flat earth proof. We'll do it by rolling some dice. I also figured every stream a few times, we should just roll six dice, just a couple times. And here's why, because there's a few really cool combos we could hit. A one of each would be really cool. And an all of one would be really cool. We'll also almost like poker. We can assign like other hands of value to like a three and three or a pair, three pairs of two. For now, we'll say what we're really going for is an all of one or a one of each. Now, it's probably not going to happen this stream, but I figure if we do it a few times per stream, just a couple casual tosses, one of them will be magical and we'll hit something really awesome. So just in case, we're going to roll these five times. Probably going to do nothing. But if we do this enough streams, we're going to hit something really cool. So there was one. And this one has a th one, two, three arrangement of how many there are. And they're all odd. That was pretty neat. I wonder with any of these throws, what interesting things we could find about it. We'll deconstruct more of the odds in some other stream of what the odds are of getting a really cool one of these throws. Now, it's not gonna happen here, but uh-oh. Okay, that one's going to just stay in the candle for now. It will, we're going to have a candle with the die in it for now. That will, you know, that's what you get once in a while in the combo class. Now, thank you all for continuing to join me for our more candlelit, casual portion of our stream, where we're going to look at some random chat comments, some random stories, and what were the other things I wanted to pull up? Let me see. I actually had a little document of some things I might mention. Oh, I wanted to pick a raspberry from outside. Some of those are starting to get ripe. Maybe uh, we'll do that later or I'll grab one. There's the plasma orb, which you have probably seen. But if I, grab, if I have to run inside at some point again, I'll grab the converter for this. And then we can plug in the plasma orb. That'll actually look cool with the trifecta. However, if I run inside, we're gonna have to put out the candles first. So that's not gonna happen yet because you never leave the combo classroom while there's fire going in the combo classroom. It's a very strict rule I tell my friends. Sometimes friends are over, we wanna light candles back here. And I'm like, okay, we'll light the candles, fun. But you never leave, you always have at least one person in the combo classroom if there are candles going. So another funny thing, if we don't end up stumbling into another topic is I got more really bad answers from the last chat GBT. However, I feel like a lot of people are going to be like, it's cause you didn't pay money for chat GPD four. Well, maybe I'll have to pay the money or get on the wait list or whatever for that. Just to prove chat GPT four, we'll still probably have some of these errors, even though it might've teamed up with Wolfram and gotten better. ChatGPT 3 seems a lot, or 3.5 is the best free one you can get right now. Seems uh, a lot better than the old one. But I tried to get it to give me cool lists again, and it was so bad. I don't understand how this thing is just continually terrible. So we might go into that in a bit. 
And we might look at a few variations on that wacky graph landscape as well. Let me flip this thing too, because the fun thing about this is when you flip it different ways, we always get weird quicksand in the background, as they call it. <laughs> now, so I think I'm going to try a small bite of the cursed fruit to see if it tastes like a plum. If it tastes weird, I'm not going to eat much of it. And do not copy me when you eat weird fruits. I'm pretty sure that it's a type of plum that grows really frequently around this area. Still, if you think something is a fruit like that, do not eat it. I've done a bit of research on this in the past, and I know certain things you never want to eat, but do not copy if you ever see that. That's probably the other tied for most dangerous thing you could copy me that you'll see me doing in episodes is the flames. If you ever see those, not the candles, but if we light bigger stuff on fire, which we do, or if we eat uh, random looking stuff, do your research if you ever eat something. But I want to try this because I'm pretty sure it's the plum like thing. Also, which cat is that? Cat? Pitch? It's pitch black. Oh, I can just feel him. I can't see him, but I can feel him. That was cool. Okay. So, that's a plum. That's an edible plum. It is a type of plum that grows around this area a lot wild. Now, here's the crazy thing. Like I mentioned earlier, where did I got this? It was in the planter bin. It didn't grow there. I didn't put it there. Small chance a squirrel put it there. More likely, fell from above from these trees that have been here all along being rarely fruiting plum trees. How do I get them to fruit more? They're in the neighbor's yard. I need to look up how to get them to fruit more and then like converse with the neighbor about that. Cause that'd be so cool if they start making real plums right here. It's a type of plum that grows around the Bay area here. You get those and you get these loquats that I already ate a bit of, but there's some more left here. I don't know if you saw this, but there's a loquat tree down there that we can visit in a bit. In fact, I wish, should have put it on my computer so I could show it right on the stream, but I did take a bonus video, I'll figure out how to use somewhere, of me picking some of these loquats. Hmm. Now, pretty soon the snack breaks are going to include a lot of apples because we have like five apple trees in the yard we share with neighbors. So, we're going to figure out some really wild and wacky apple experiments. We already did last year to a degree. There's an episode called Apple Science on the Combo Class channel, but I feel like we can take it further. So when there's too many apples, we're literally like, when I have somebody come over, I'm like, do you want like 10 apples to go? And please take a bag full of apples. We have like so many. We'll put them out on the street sometimes and I'll, when we have a bunch, sometimes I'll make applesauce and figure out just every way to cook them. We found that they're surprisingly good when you wrap them in foil and throw them in a campfire. And doing these little candles out here does make me think, before too long, I'm going to want to do another whole camping campfire-esque stream out here. So, uh, there is room over there. The best campfires we did a little bit ago were because the desk wasn't here yet. We were in between desks. The old one was destroyed and this one wasn't here yet. Uh, the end of grade negative one. We'll probably get there at the end of grade negative two. This desk is only gonna last so many episodes. But for now, there's less room for a tent, but I can maybe sneak one in, but there's probably room for a campfire. And we could do that in a bit and see all sorts of foods that we can home cook on the campfire. I might also want for fun to do a snack break where for one day, I might only eat stuff I can get from the yard and from around the combo class. However, it's going to be pretty much only fruits and maybe a shred of vegetable or two. So, but I think I could get a good variety of fruits, enough to make it a day of food. So, we might try that for a snack break. Even though one of the snack breaks I'm still planning is the edible peel conspiracy, as well as the seven hour egg. Those are probably coming this grade. <laughs> now, um... Let's see what else we were going to discuss here. 
Du, 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 du. Uh, sorry, I need to pull open the chat up here. Du, 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 du. So, lots of comments. Somebody says the bug proved flat earth. Yeah, I think uh, the bug did prove flat earth. We'll go into it more in the future, how easy it is to prove the earth's a globe. We can do it with sundial-like stuff. We can make some sticks in the ground and take some photos of them at different times of day, and it's going to prove the earth's a globe. So there's like a variety of really simple experiments you could do to prove it. Also, if you go to the ocean, like I live by this place called the Bay Area, like Marina, and there's a big stretch of water. And if you go to the coast and you look at the water, you can see the curve. People are just like, uh, maybe they think it's the eye that's doing it because eyes are round, but y you can literally see if you're at a big enough stretch of ocean that there's a tiny arc to it. And not to mention the boats coming thing where you see the front of the boat first. So, flat earthers get wrecked. Now, let's see. Um, so we will prove it at some point. Someone says only eat flat prunes. Uh, yeah, pr prunes are a little underrated. I guess they're mostly like do stuff to your stomach or something or help with digestion. But they're a dried fruit, technically. I do like dried fruits. Uh, some dried fruits I'm allergic to. I'm allergic to this thing called sulfites that's in wine, that's in most wines, that's in those bright dried fruits, the like oranges that are hella bright, orange, and other, or I mean the apricots that are dried but are hella bright orange, and stuff like that. So unfortunately I can't eat those. I think I'm also allergic to shellfish. Because I've had some reactions to that, which sucks. Because you develop that in your 20s. I used to love eating seafood. And then I started getting reactions when I turned to like 18, 19, 20-ish or so. And sometimes that happens. And then you get a reverse tolerance. And the more times it happens, it gets worse and worse. Sounds like out of a fiction book. It's like a, an anti-tolerance. As opposed to like a tolerance to a drug where you it affects you less each time. You get an anti-tolerance to seafood. Seafood, where each time you eat lobster, you will get a worse reaction. The first few times, you can take this Benadryl pill and it'll make everything okay. But if you, due to your anti-tolerance, if you mess with it too much, you will hit a point where that's not enough. That's like, sounds like out of a fiction book, but that's actually what the doctor told me. So, yeah, uh, sorry to whoever said they're allergic to milk and corn, if that's true. Uh, being allergic to stuff sucks. I can get, like, rashes to stuff. I can get allergies. I can get, like, dust can set me off. Like, random stuff can set me off. So, yeah, it can be really annoying. Some people have it worse than me. And anaphylactic, somebody mentioned, is the type of bad reaction when it makes your breathing difficult. And, yes, I could get that if I did too bad of seafood. Probably not the first time I did it. But if I did it too many times in a row, due to the anti-tolerance, I might have an anaphylactic reaction. I don't know what types of seafood. It's happened with shrimps. So I want to test it more. I need to get an EpiPen from the doctor and slowly test it. And yes, we're going to do it on film. And <laughs> we're going to do one day where we eat squids. Those have a little beak. So that it's possible that squids can give you a reaction. Really hope the squids don't. I used to... I used to be able to get squid for cheap. I would cook squid and rice and teriyaki, and it was so good. And you could just cook squid and rice. Oh, yeah. So I better not be allergic to squid. No, I might be, though. Then if I'm not allergic to that, we're going to move onward and try, you know, different types. Like we'll try a crab or a, a shrimp or whatever. Uh, probably on different days to test the reaction. I need to get an EpiPen first, the thing that you stick on yourself and it like jabs into your skin really abruptly if you have a reaction and shoots you with this chemical that gets you all endorphined up but causes you to not have the reaction that you can't breathe so <laughs> i know people say it's not enough but i need to test it at some point in my lifetime so there is going to be an episode someday that snack break testing my allergies <clears throat> Uh, 
Somebody says I should make a video with a flat earther. I would love to interview people like that. If anybody genuine, I mean, I'll be able to detect if you just want some clout and you actually don't believe it. If you actually think some really out there conspiracy, feel free to reach out to me. My email's in the bio, even though I'm slow at getting back to people, feel free to reach out to me because I would happily interview a flat earther. And trust me, you know, I, I like to roast people. So maybe, you know, I could be playful with them at times, but I'm open to hearing any opinion. I am not addicted to the fact that the earth isn't flat. We read a very outdated hundred facts. Somebody thinks they got a new fact that proves the earth's not flat. Give it to me. I'll interview you. I won't be mean. So probably. So, you know, it, if your flat earthy thing ties into some like, uh, weird, like racist or sexist undertone, like some conspiracy theories do, then maybe I'll be mean. But if your flat earth theory is just, you think the earth's flat, then we can just have a chat. Now, <laughs> uh, there are other conspiracies that are interesting to analyze at some point too in the future, but do not get too addicted to theory, conspiracy theories. The problem with those is not the part where they think something's a possibility. The problem is the part where they think that a possibility means a probably true, let's react on that. So ha have a, all the hypotheses you want. Write a great long essay about your weird conspiracy hypothesis. Just don't change your day-to-day -day life based on it, probably. You know, don't change the way you treat other people based on it. But feel free, come up with your weird hypotheses about the universe. I have weird hypotheses. I haven't presented my weird hypotheses yet. I think weird things about the space-time continuum that I'll present over the grades. You know, by the time we hit grade negative five, I'll tell you what I really think about fractals and what about what I really think about the universe and stuff. What I think about synchronicities and meaningful coincidences. But, you know, those are f far from thinking the Earth is flat, where we'll go with it. We'll go with some fun hypotheses, though. Those are always good. Now, some of these candles are naturally dying. When the candles die for a moment, I'm going to run inside because I need to use the bathroom again real quick. But when I come back, we're going to still do just a little more chatting and a little more random stuff. I'm going to bring a book or two. They'll be possibly fun to look at. And feel free to leave any questions in the chat because, you know, a lot of our streams have a mathematical topic then devolve into a Q&A. We will pull up one more graph because... When these candles, uh, I need to wait till they're unlit or blow them out if I need to go inside because remember the rule, need at least one human present whenever there's candles in the combo class. Um, let's see different combos we could do with this because this, this wacky iterated thing looks really cool when we say that's less than or equal to that with some of the Y's and X's flipped. Look at that. Wowie zowie. So, these are pretty cool. Thank you to all the combo lords who are sticking around, and our next part of our stream will continue to be on the more casual end, but I'm gonna need to blow out these candles, run inside for a second. We're gonna switch lighting styles for a minute. We may need to bring back the candles. I have plenty, and these still have some juice in them, but also, and I might want to do a candle experiment. I kind of want to show you something weird that happened long ago. Okay, we're going to do a kind of a flame-based candle experiment. That I, nobody copy when I do it. Then also, I'm going to grab the converter to the plasma orb so that if we don't relight the candles right away, we can add the plasma orb to our other thing. Now, some of my goals as the combo class budget grows will be to get a really big version of these cool science things. I want huge plasma orb. I want huge Toro flux. All right, so this thing's gonna be going as your main source of entertainment for a moment, as well as this graph. So I'll be back in like three minutes with a converter, some books, and don't ask me why, but a few wood chips. You'll see why in a minute. Actually, hold up, it's so dark here. I need my phone to like use as a flashlight to go actually on the way back. Where is my phone in there? Okay, here it is. Okay, cool. So, we will be back shortly. I'm going to have to 
this, I'm not sure exactly what's going right here. So just to make sure I don't mess anything up or play any background audio or ads or anything, I'm going to cut the audio for a minute. But leave any thoughts. I'll be back very soon.
What's up, my combo lords? I have returned with a few more sources of light. And for anyone joining, we are in the more casual part of the stream where we look at graphs and chat about various things. But there will be some fun little things to note. The first will be our plasma orb, which is a pretty awesome source of light if I can get this going. Do, do, do. There we go. Plasma. So, this is the one I want a really big one of that I can't find. As well as, I guess, a giant ferro fluid wouldn't hurt as well. I also have another source of light. And let's, in fact, I'm going to turn this computer light very low, basically off, so we can see just these sources of light for a moment. The, well, actually, it'll help to have a little more light. The plasma orb here attracts to your finger in a cool way. And these lights are funny because when they get too much light on them, they might turn off, I believe, if they get too bright on them. Let's see if this will turn it off. Maybe not. Maybe it's just decided to go on for a while. But it's solar powered on the top, and so it charged up in the day and now it's using the light that it charged up with. So these are pretty neat. We can have those applying a little bonus light in the background that charged up in the yard in the day. And I will light one or two more candles because I want to try a little experiment that, like I said, don't copy, which is when you light a candle, you expect that, oh, it's this size of candle, it's a candle. It's only gonna make a tiny flame. But the flame is kind of dependent on the wick. And when you have one of these nice and melted, I might need to melt one of these a bit more. There was one time when I was a kid and I had some candles at my desk that I was indoors and so it wasn't the safest. Uh, and, you know, I was less set up. And I had a melted candle, and I was trying to relight it, but the wick wasn't going. And I had a little wood chip, because there's wood chips in my yard. And let me get a few of these so I can have one that's just for melted wax. And here's the one the dye got stuck in. Uh-oh. Well, that's a new, uh, we'll just leave that in the classroom for later. Dice candle. Now, uh, when it got a nice melted puddle of wax, I dipped one of these wood chips in and kind of coated it in the wax a little bit and sort of made a wick out of it. I was like, what if this was the wick? Would it work? And it made a really big flame. Don't worry. If it makes a big flame, my hose is right there if I need to turn it off for some reason. But I want to try and take a little new wick we're going to create. We're going to see if we could turn this branch into a wick. And I'm coating it with wax a little bit to get it more wickified. Uh-oh, I turned out the candle by accident, but we're getting this one waxy for now. That's okay. Let's see if that's enough waxiness to make it a wick. I don't know if it will be. See, when I tried this as a kid, for some reason, it made a really big flame. Enough so that it, like, spooked me. It was like the flame the size of the candle. Maybe I need a smaller or woodier chunk. This is a really wood chippy wood chip, but it's kind of big. Maybe I can break off a piece of it. Hmm. Maybe a really wood chippy wood chip will work. Let's try a really wood chippy wood chip. Maybe I'm making it too waxy. When I did this before, for some reason it made, like, a flame the size of the candle, which it seemed, like, improbable, but it ended up happening. Now, this time it might not work. I'll have to look at the science of why that happened when I was a kid. Uh, we might have to just light our candles as normal, and we'll try experimenting with wicks over time. Yes, I did get a lot of melted wax on me. No, it's not as hot as one might think. You can get a little, ow, the lighter flame can be hot, but the candle wax 
is not actually as hot as one might think. Now, to all my combo lords joining me, let's see. Somebody says, uh, various flat earth different comments and probably jokes. And I might have burnt the lab coat a little bit there. I don't... Did that get on film? I think the lab coat lit for a bit. These lab coats are supposed to be somewhat fireproof. What's up with the lab coat lighting for a bit? Did that get on the stream? The lab coat got a burn mark. Okay, well... Like I said, we're almost one-sixth, or maybe one-sixth of the way through grade negative two. So, that's the, um, the lab coat will slowly evolve. I know the cleanliness fans and the less chaos fans are going to like the earlier portions of the grade. So, we're going to slowly evolve. I'm going to need to cut that clip out or something. Oh, man. That's why I said do not copy, especially if you got a long supposedly not flammable lab coat on. Oh man, someone needs to clip that. Somebody should like uh, clip that into something. By the way, if anyone ever thinks there's a funny moment from my live stream that they want to turn into any sort of video or short or whatever, they can feel free. As long as you credit me, you can use my content in any way. As long as you put a link to my stuff too. Now, I need to get that clip though of me on fire. That's funny, kinda. But yeah, you, like I said, we got a hose right there. I'm prepared for if for some reason it lit the inner underclock, then I would be ready to exterminate all of it with water. Right now, let's gather all of our candle, oops, put one out, into one little zone, and then we know exactly where the fire's at. We're gonna make a little candle zone. You get a little triangle of the still lit candles. Now, somebody asked, will this live be saved? Yes, they always are. However, since some of them get so casual, I often try and time st stamp them after. If anybody who's a very astute viewer notes what moments are good, and after the fact leaves a comment with some like times when it happened, which I'm not sure if you're able to keep track of that live or if you'd have to rewatch that bit after, but very helpful because it takes me a while to put timestamps. And on these long stretches, I often just timestamp them like, okay, this is the bit we're chatting for half an hour. But even if there's a lot of topics that get mixed in there, I don't have time to go through the entire live afterward. So I like to timestamp the best moments. That's why I was thinking I'm gonna do some lives possibly going forward on Twitch, which I'll let people know and cut down just the best bit of each live for YouTube in a more edited form. And that I can be extra, whoa, extra free form there. And, you know, if, if you like the only pure educational stuff, you don't have to follow me there. And you can, you know, watch the videos whose titles seem like the right thing up your alley. But uh, on there, I will also let myself bite my tongue a little less. So there could be a mild amount of swearing or, you know, jokes or things like that. They're also, I won't be worried about the copyright as much, so I might use random stuff. And if they ban me from there, they ban me. Who cares? As long as YouTube doesn't get mad at me. Love you, YouTube. So, yeah, in short, the live will be saved. And normally, this section would just be time stamped with like the section when we're chatting with candles or whatever. But in this case, I will probably make an additional time stamp for my sleeve caught on fire at this second. I need to rewatch it, how it actually looked. I don't know. <laughs> but yeah, the lives get saved. So, um, what we'll do is set up some good lights back here so we can exterminate the candles and not worry about the candles in a moment and just have a different variety of fun lights in our realm. So, let's see. These we will... There we go. Okay, does that work? Kind of like weave them through stuff. I don't know if you can even see this part of the screen. Okay. I got them on here, so I'll have to uh, put the camera over there. Yep, they're in the abacai. It worked. Okay, no more flames.
All the lights are on this side now. Um, now that kind of looks like fire, but that's not. That's these two, oh man, glow in the dark ones. Not glow in the dark, but <laughs> save up solar panel and go in, the, go in the dark. Now there is a glow in the dark. Where's my glow in the dark? This you can only see when it's very dark. Glow in the dark, you see? Normal clocks you wouldn't be able to see like that at night. Glow in the dark. I don't know if you can see it enough. Let me turn off as much light as I can. Now I have glow in the dark spray paint, so I might glow in the dark spray paint something cool in the combo classroom at some point. Waiting to think about what the best option for that is. Now, another thing I wanted to note is that I was gonna grab a book, but I couldn't find it right away, which was called Fads and Fallacies by Martin Gardner. I grabbed my big collection from him. This is an author I recommended before. Great author of different mathematical puzzles and recreational math facts and cool stuff. And this is a, just a collection of a bunch of different articles and columns he wrote that are brilliant. Uh, any collection from him is gonna be great. He also though wrote some other books that are about like that pseudoscience-ish type thing we were doing, like when we were analyzing what's weird about their flat earth proof and what's funny about the belief that they think that. And uh, sometime I'll grab his book called Fads and Fallacies and show some passages out of that. I, uh, I think he even wrote more than one book on that topic. That's the one I have. But the Fads and Fallacies is the one I have that he kind of delved into that topic. It's funny, sometimes you'll see a mathematician who I happen to have a random trait that I can really relate to and for Martin Gardner, maybe it's apart from liking puzzles, he randomly liked this strange analysis of pseudoscience beliefs. And for one of his friends, Raymond Smullyan, I believe I actually have a lot in common with. He liked playing piano, he liked doing magic tricks. Those used to be big hobbies of mine, still are to a degree. He liked uh, logic puzzles and telling little fantasy stories about them. So Raymond Smullyan, Martin Gardner's friend, is really underrated, but Martin Gardner is the one I have here. There's a lot of cool demonstrations in this book where, for example, let me tell you some of the chapters of the type of articles that they're about. There's one about, cur these are examples of some chapters in it. Curves of constant width, packing spheres, uh, rotations and reflections, Oh, knots. Okay, they got knots. Remember we were talking about knots? All right, baby, we got knots. So here, he doesn't have pictures of all of them. Oh, he has a quote from Alice in Wonderland. A knot, said Alice, always ready to make herself useful and looking anxiously about her. Oh, let me help to undo it. I don't know what the context of that was. Uh, he probably just found a not quote in there and wanted to include it because Alice in Wonderland has other mathematical things. The guy who wrote that, Lewis Carroll, actually was a logician and loved math and tucked some secret math into his books, including Alice in Wonderland. Now, not only is that a cool fantasy story for kids or whatever, or for any age, but A, I realized that two of my favorite like creative people weirdly made art reminiscent of that book. Raymond Smullyan, who I mentioned, has a few books that are like twists on Alice in Wonderland and involve those characters as part of his logic puzzles. And then our, maybe my favorite filmmaker, this very, uh, not very well known, at least in America, I believe from Czechoslovakia, maybe, stop motion filmmaker named Jan Schwankmeier, uh, which is, let me type it up here made a version of Alice in Wonderland that is so trippy and crazy and cool. Um, like, you have to see this film sometime of this stop motion version of Alice in Wonderland. 
absolutely insane with the stop motion creatures and other stuff. That filmmaker is a uh, very cool, surreal stop motion, Jan Schwankmeier. Now, uh, so Alice in Wonderland actually is a classic story to many logicians even because it does secretly have some math in it and stuff like that. Now, some of the knots that we can see here in Martin Gardner's book are, there's a figure of part of a knot right there. I don't see the top part of it. Here's a way showing that they intertwine in a cube and stuff. He finds a way to combo a lot of subjects, which you know is my favorite when you uh, weave one subject into another in a combo. Most of my favorite episode topics are me finding like at least two different things that connect together in a cool way. Now, there's a version of a knot. There we got another knot. So, knot theory is even in the book that I happened to bring out. Just an example of Martin Gardner likes writing about all sorts of cool mathematics. This thing, now, the subject would be called knot theory, but overall a lot of people call people like him recreational mathematics. He wasn't seeking to prove a singular theorem over the course of many years or anything. He was seeking to, in a, to a degree, popularize certain concepts, as well as cultivate and add little bits of his own findings, but even more so cultivate other people's findings into one place that he often presented as puzzles and things like that. He was one of the first to present the Monty Hall problem, and he popularized John Conway's Game of Life. He popularized Pentominoes. So he brought a lot of underrated, cool mathematical things to the surface. Somebody asked what's on page 42, and I will oblige. What is on page 42 is... The least area rotor in an equilateral triangle. And this is a Thrivenesque concept that I believe might be talking about shapes... Oh, this is the shapes of constant width thing. So I need to get one of these. I'm going to order one of these online sometime or find a good way to get one. A shape of constant width. The sphere isn't the only shape of constant width. You can make these weird other shapes that are of constant width. What about things of constant height? The sphere isn't the only like 2D thing of constant width. There's these weird triangle-esque things that also have constant width. So we will look into those strange other ones. Okay, 420. That's actually funny. I never thought too much about how two of the classic meme numbers, 42 from the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, 420 from we're not going to say what, from, you know, 420 from being the smallest number divisible by all of the whole numbers, 1 through 7. Uh, what's this? There's like a weird clue in here. There's a receipt in here. I always think those are clues when you find one. Probably just a bookmark, but a clue. Now, okay, we're going to go to 420. I'll do it. I never thought about how those are kind of similar looking numbers. You multiply your Douglas Adams by 10 and you get your other meme number. So, well, oh, what we have right here is they're talking about the game of life, which we are going to talk about sometime. Remember how I said you popularized Conway's game of life? It's a cellular automata game with really simple rules where shapes evolve in insane ways. And we're going to combine that with uh, learning about pentominoes because it's square grids and most pentominoes do normalish stuff. And some pentominoes, like the R pentomino, go crazy. And yes, this book has far more than 420 pages. This is a big collection of a lot of his works. And look, 418 and 19 are just pictures of this cool game of life configuration. What's on 420 though? Uh, what's on there is at the end of that chapter, essentially. It's talking about more about the game of life. It doesn't make sense out of context. Now, those are fun. Now, trust me, I don't mind the meme numbers as examples. We're going to need some random number examples, so... Always okay to bust out the classics. Now, thank you to everybody who is leaving cool comments about various things. To somebody who's noting knots and knots and knots, it's true that knot can be many things. There's N-O-T, meaning knot. 
And that's a mathematical concept because if you work in logic, like propositional logic, that, you know, some of this stuff is even more so his friend Raymond Smolian I mentioned. A lot of his puzzles can be broken down into what combos of ands and ors and nots and things like, and if thens and things like that are we making? And so there's nots in math. Then there's K-N-O-T's. We saw some of those in math. There's also another pretty wild one. Now, you know how I've mentioned when we say that, yes, we can call infinity a number, but we have to, to a degree, say there's multiple infinities if we start calling it a number-like thing. Well, these Aleph numbers cal categorize the various types of infinity. And look, the first one, which is the cardinality, meaning essentially how many there are, the size of the natural numbers, the simplest type of infinity in a way, the one called countable infinity often, the first Hebrew letter and then a zero, Aleph, not not meaning zero, N0UGHT is a term that can mean zero or nothing. And so Aleph not, although it's called Aleph zero or Aleph null or something sometimes, I usually call it that most common term. It's like another not sounding like thing. So sometimes things sound like other things, you know. The last three letters of my show name sounds like another thing. Now, don't get me started on the YouTube glitch where they actually were playing that. So, now, Aleph's numbers, we will go into in the future. Those are really cool. The first time we're going to go into them is going to have to include a uh, there's an episode I'm planning before too long that's going to be about why is the amount of fractions the same infinity as the amount of whole numbers, but the amount of real numbers a bigger infinity. So that's a pretty big scale one we'll do at some point before long. It's going to use uh, for part of it, although there are other unique things certainly I will mix in. Uh, part of it will use a classic, which is called Cantor's Diagonalization Argument which is a classic old technique to show that there are more real numbers than fractions. Now, oh, someone says Aleph in Wonderland. That's a good combination. That's true. Aleph in Wonderland. Yes. I don't know if that's actually the name of anything or not. If it's not, good one. Now, uh, those numbers will come in the future. For now, we assume... Infinity doesn't get to be a number unless we pull it in once in a while. Kind of like I. Normally we're like, okay, probably not taking square roots of negative things. If I got to, we're looking at the complex numbers. We're busting out a new realm. Now sometimes in the future we're going to bust out a different new realm that's not going to the complex numbers. It's going past the finite numbers <laughs> to types of infinity. And things that they call... Things like transfinite numbers, large cardinals. Now, somebody mentioned that a globe thing that rotates with the Earth magnetic pole. Uh, I have not, but I do like my science toys. Some of these were sent to me by an awesome supporter. And uh, let's see, George was the awesome supporter who has sent me a bunch of this stuff. And some of this, like the plasma orb I bought myself, uh, this one is cheap. And I'm going back to the mailbox to see what else people may have mailed me this weekend sometime. Remember that if you want to send any rare items you'd like to see in a stream, or if you'd like to send any old broken clocks or dice or such, uh, my mailbox, not my home address, but a private mailbox I have, is linked in the description. Of course, a quick reminder again, there's 20 seconds. Uh, there's also a bunch of shorts linked that in a make sure you've seen the combo class shorts Make sure you've seen the latest two episodes or bonus videos. I dropped on this channel Stay tuned for a periodic monotile episode coming on combo class this weekend If you have any extra budget supporting the patreon is really helpful There's also a cool discord and subreddit. 
Okay, done with my 20 seconds. Okay, so somebody is asking this thing about like PEMDAS. Well, let me calculate that. That would be it. No, that would be 25. It is 25. I'm not sure what the other person was thinking, but it's just bad. It's that type of questions bad. I'll do an episode about that sometime about how those questions are like lame types of tricks. They're sort of like when you try and ask someone one of the, not that you're doing that by wondering in the comment, but the people who originally pose those questions are trying to get a bunch of comments by people debating different possible answers because there is different ways of interpreting things. So it's when you put a divided by, it's just like you have to write it as one big fraction, or if you can't do that on your screen, if you can't write it fraction mode with numerators and denominators, then you gotta put parentheses. And so there, there's gonna be other ones. I'll, I'll mention that in the future about how that type of question does sometimes have multiple answers and is just being like a fake paradox almost because it's like, I'm subjective, but only because of the notation, not because of anything at the core of the mathematics is subjective. What's subjective is the notation. It's a semantics debate. So, you know, to me, it's almost like those questions are like fake paradoxes. And of course, people think sometimes I call a thing a paradox that they're like, that's not a paradox because it, that's a subjective term and can just mean something that sounds contradictory or feels contradictory to someone. But in this case, it's more of a semantics language issue when you're looking at order of operations. Because there's a way to write it where it's not ambiguous. So it's almost the same as if I asked, like, what's the second even number? And you're like, well, do I start from zero and say the second even number is two? Or do I start from two and say the second even number is four? And I'm like, no, I just asked what's the second even number. There's like more possible answers because I'm just being vague. So, you know, those questions are purposefully vague. Now, somebody says on a calculator it equals 21. Well, the calculator is probably doing the divided by as if it's some big fraction or something because you weren't clear enough to it, so it's giving a guess on where it wants to put the parentheses. If you put the parentheses, you get to pick where they are. If you just feed it to the calculator and you make it ambiguous, it might pick where it thinks the parentheses should be. So try it with, it's actually a good exercise for the brain. Try it with parentheses in different places and see if you can get both those answers. Can you get with the parentheses it to say each of those things with those in different places? Then you can figure out what it might have been doing wrong. So, also a fun thing. I want to make a video about this sometime because I used to be really into it as a kid. My, my most popular short on here is about a divide by zero error, but I liked all the errors on calculators. I want to go back on some calculators and see what are all the possible errors you can get. So that's the majority of what we are going to do today for our stream. I think I'm going to wrap up pretty soon. So leave any final comments if you have any cool thoughts or whatever. This was partially to give a lot of bonus content for people to digest over the weekend. Most people who watch part of this probably haven't seen all. If you need more combo stuff over the weekend, you can watch the stream and all the stuff linked in the description. There will be coming out possibly tomorrow, probably more likely Sunday, my 13 or 14 minute episode about aperiodic monotiles, and then a lot more fun stuff coming. So I'll keep you all posted on how that stuff's going. And we also got some good jokes in the chat. People can always use jokes in the chat. And to someone who said, keep using parentheses till it equals 42. Now, I'm not sure if that's possible with the fives, but it is an age old uh, question, rearranging things, how many different answers you can get. And I don't know if you've ever played the four fours puzzle, but when I was in about sixth grade, about 12 years old, 11 years old or so, uh, the teacher had this bonus question on a worksheet or something that me and some of my nerdier friends got really into, which was 
four fours. You have four fours and whatever operations you want. Now here's where it gets ambiguous, you know, am I allowed to stick a factorial after? Am I allowed to say a square root of something or a square root considered the second root and that adds a two? What What is a notation that doesn't count as a number is ambiguous, but you get four fours and notation between them. So to start, you could say, I get addition, subtraction, multiplication, division, exponentiation, and parentheses. That's a good start. We sometimes need to bust out other things like being like, okay, I'm going to put the summation symbol and pretend I'm allowed to make the that triangular number essentially, sum all the numbers up to four or whatever. But pick your batch of notation and see which numbers you can get. Using four fours, you can get one, two, three, four, five. How high can you go? So, uh, a lot of fun little bonus content will be coming out as well as I'm most excited about my episodes that will be coming out uh, in this next one. Got some fun shapes to play around with. We did get some more cat cameos as well. It's Dandelion, the fluffy one, got cameos and cat meows or cameows. I never know which gag to say because one day I thought like, oh, they're not doing cameos, they're doing cat meows. But then I realized they're doing cameows. And then if you try and do both gags at once and you say cat meows, you can't tell you were trying to say cameos, so you lose the gag completely. So they're doing cat meows or cameos. Now, gonna cut off there. Thank you for all the people who continue to join and help us with our growth because this channel is skyrocketing past the other Combo Class channel where, remember, my main episodes are over there. Um, and this is, just keeps going up. It's, a, it's at like 146,000 or something, or close to that. It's going to get to 146,000 soon. Uh, really awesome and cool, and especially cool when we have a community growing of people who I see in my streams a lot, all the people who join the streams consistently. I do recognize your names. Awesome. And the people who join our Discord or, you know, post in the subreddit or email me or whatever. Love you all. Really, you're so cool. You're my combo lords. We're going to do even cooler learning and even cooler philosophy and nature and all my favorites going forward. Our next one will be the monotiles and then back to a little bit of number theory, like some of my favorite things, playing around with numbers. Now, uh, I'll add timestamps to this stream at some point later. Can't do it this moment, but, you know, like I do, I try and get them out. I missed it by a little margin on the last stream, but I try and get the timestamps in before the HD is processed because it takes a while for YouTube to process the chat anyway. So I'm like, okay, I'll try and add timestamps before the chat makes it uh, fully available to everyone with HD. But I realize a lot of people watch it while it's just the SD is up in the first like five hours of the stream being up or whatever. So maybe I'll see if I can put some timestamps in like an hour. If anyone wants, find the moment where my sleeve caught on fire and timestamp that in a comment. And also if you do that, put in parentheses Remember that Demotro said not to copy anything with fire. Please put that in. I don't want YouTube mad about it. I pl I'll play with fire more and more if we know YouTube's not mad about it. So put in parentheses if you timestamp when the sleeve lit on fire. Remember that Demotro said not to copy anything with fire. So, and then I'll add more of the timestamps later. Okay, I love you all. I'm gonna wrap it up there. We'll be back with more fun, insane action very soon. And I hope you all have a marvelous day or night, wherever you are. Okay, I tried to turn the lights all the way off so I could do a dramatic ending and then I couldn't see where to 